Um, so why don't you tell me about... Actually, well, let's start with something really simple. Like, how did you get discovered for the show? I was... Um, the way I got discovered by Lauren Michaels for Saturday Night Live is I was doing stand-up, and so I knew Sandler and uh, Spade from stand-up. And then they told uh, their boss, Lauren, about me. And uh, he kind of takes people's words for stuff. So then he uh, called me, said, uh, talk to me and stuff. And I said, yeah, man, I'd like to do that job. And what was it, like, did you, were you sort of, I mean, obviously it's financially it was great, it's a good platform, but did you kind of buy, like, were you into the myth of it? Like, did you love it when you were younger? Yes, I, I grew up on it because I think I was, uh, I think I was 13 when the first show was on. And I remember seeing the first show because I think, George Carlin was the host. So I was, and it was, like the only two new things I remember when I was young was Letterman and uh, and uh, Saturday Night Live that was different than all the rest of the TV it was all sort of old, for old people, mm-hmm. kind of corny. And so, yeah, I wasn't, but I, I was just wanted to do stand-up. It wasn't like I was aiming towards Saturday Night Live. And, and even when Lauren like, called me, he said like, you got to do two, uh, write two sketches, do two characters and two impressions, and then I said I don't, I can't do any of that, you know. <laughs> so I think he just liked me that I was stupid, and you know, I was from Canada. And I talked to him about being in Canada. I remember he had a show in Canada when I was a kid, the Hart and Lauren Hart Pomerantz, and he had it with a comedy team. Mm-hmm. They did a show when I was a little boy, and I remember that. Because it was sort of like the precursor to Saturday Night Live was sort of super cool compared to Wayne and Schuster. So he liked that I that I remember that he liked that I liked that, <laughs> and uh, and then I think he just got a kick out of the fact that I uh, I knew if I did anything in, in terms of trying to do a character or uh, <laughs> I would be dead. So I knew my best hope was just to say I couldn't. So you didn't do anything for your, like, what did you do nothing, for the audition? Nothing, I didn't do an audition. And so, what, can, you, can you describe, like, what was your first day like on the show? Do you remember your first day? My first day on Saturday Night Live? Yeah, work, like, working, not the, not the yeah. first show, but the first day that you were. The first, there. oh, the first day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I showed up, uh, this happens a lot on Saturday Night Live. I showed up um, the first day, and no one was there, and uh, I just sat on a couch. Yeah, yeah. What time did you show up? Well, like eight in the morning or something. I thought like that's when jobs started. I didn't know. <laughs> so then uh, no one was there forever. Like and f- finally people started like shambling in at four or five in the afternoon, and uh, you know I was already <laughs> finishing my day, and uh, <laughs> that's that's what I remember about the first day, just being all alone. But it's cool because I just went through everything. You know, rifled through people's stuff and looked at old tapes and went in Lauren's office and yeah. had a shower. <laughs> there was a shower there. So. Yeah, Lauren has a shower in his office. <laughs> <laughs> I think only he and I have ever used it. So when what was the first sketch that you ever got on? Or what was the first written material that you ever got on the show? I wrote a sketch for the first show. Uh, because Burt Reynolds had just uh, was on Larry King Live and was kind of famous at the time that because he was in a contentious divorce with Lonnie Anderson and he on he he was wearing his crazy purple suit on Larry King Live and he announced, "I will, you know, Lonnie Anderson is lying, and I will get her on this show with you, Larry, and we'll both take truth serum." And I was like, truth serum? What? Is that even a real thing? So it was so funny. And then so I wrote a sketch where they both drank, like from beakers of truth serum, you know. And uh, Lauren did not care for it. It opened the show, you know. It was like a big uh, hit at the table. Uh, uh, What's his name? Did Burt Reynolds, uh, Phil Hartman. It was Phil Hartman and Jan Jan Hooks. And uh, (laughs) it just... uh, I, the next week, Lauren like pointed it, pointed to it as the example of what we should not be doing on the show. He said it was just the, you know, 
he calls things Carol Burnettish, you know, which is the ultimate insult. He said it was just the most Carol Burnettish type of sketch. <laughs> but I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know. And he let me do it. It got all the way to the air. He chose it and he put it on first. Not my fault. Um, do you think like it's weird I think people have a weird sense of what because it's like he's such a personality I think people have a weird sense of like how much control he has uh-huh. at the time when you were working there like what because it's like he didn't like that sketch and yet it still was first like how right. much control did he actually have in terms of the actual shaping of the show absolute control he had absolute control over everything uh, the entire time I was there and and the entire time I ever remember him, except for one thing, I think in the history of the show, he didn't have control over uh, when I did Weekend Update. I That's the about that. so only, th- yeah. only thing that Lauren didn't have any control over. Um, and did it like, um, but at the same time, it's like it seems like the whole, the way that the show's worked or what... What has made it work at different times is that he's he's allowed different kinds of co- comedy to be on the show. So it's not like it's just going with his own taste, I guess, right? Like he's, he's amazing that way, yeah. yeah. Like he's told me, I don't get that guy, but, you know, and he allows comedy that he even doesn't like uh, to be on the show. And I remember being mad at him going, come on, Lauren, what, is, what the fuck are you doing? Like, why is I was dancing and singing and shit? It's supposed to be, this is a comedy show. And then he's told me, and he goes, no, it's not a comedy show. This is a variety show. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know. <laughs> that was a comedy show. But uh, he said, I think if you could sing or dance, you'd think differently. And I was like, yeah, I guess he's right. Um, the show itself started with very, it started, at, at its, its beginnings were that it was doing something very different on TV. Did you feel a sense of like it had lost interest in pushing boundaries or something at the time you were there? Like. Um, at the time, yes, I, I, because I would always write sketches that would be rejected out of hand, you know. And I would go, why? Controversial. And I was like, well, I thought that's what we did. I thought that's what Saturday Night Live was, you know. But I was kind of living in the past. But but then on, but then when we got update, I went I, I went a little uh, I went a little crazy because uh, <laughs> I had the freedom, you know. And and I engineered it all so that I got Downey, you know, because uh, I knew if I had Downey, I'd have a lot of power behind me. Um, but then okay. Me and said, I should ask you about Rodney Dangerfield when he was on the show. You had some experience with him. Can you tell me that story. <laughs> Rodney came on the show to uh, do update. Like sometimes Lauren would just go, "Oh, Rodney." Dangerfield is here, you know, and you go, oh, we don't know, how do we use them, you know? It'd be hard to use them on update. Yeah. So then Jim had this idea, Jim Downey, uh, where I would go, uh, you know, he, uh, he would go, I tell you, I got no respect, you know, do a joke, and then I go, oh, that seems funny. I'm running, you know, getting respect. What about your kids? And you know, they must give you respect, you know? Yeah. You're doing good. My, my kids, they don't give me respect. I do a few more jokes, you know? I go, that seems hard to believe. What about, certainly, like, if you went to a bar, like a bartender would give you respect, right? You go, I tell you, dude, I go, like, this is atrocious. You know? But anyways, Rodney's like, what the fuck? He didn't understand any of that. He's like, why, oh, does this motherfucker know I don't get no respect? You know? So, uh, anyways, we get, we have, you have to do the show at 8.30, and then the dress rehearsal, and then at 11.30, you know? So he had to get there real early, you know, and uh, he said, Norm, I got to talk to you. I was like, well, he says, why the fuck? He goes, I know how to do my jokes. Why can't I just leave and come back at midnight? You know, I'm like, well, I don't know, Rodney. Like, uh, you have to do the dress rehearsal. You know, they make us do the dress rehearsals. He goes, I don't mind. Yeah, he goes, I don't mind fucking. I have done it a million times. I go, yeah, I know. I don't know. What? So, so uh, <clears throat> then he goes, then he said, I tell you, we were all alone, you know, and Rodney was with, like my hero and stuff. And he goes, uh, he goes, I tell you, kid, it's all waiting, you know. He goes, just fucking waiting. You see? Yeah. He goes, you do TV, you just sit in a room and you wait all the time, you know. He goes, the same with movies. You just sit in a trailer and you wait the whole fucking time. He goes, that's no life, you know. He goes, oh, you know, all there is is stand-up. He goes, oh, the rest of it's all shit. You know, movies are shit, TV's shit, you know. 
He goes, always remember, kid, let's just stand up. So it's very, like, moving and everything. And then he goes, uh, he pauses, and then he goes, stand up is shit. You know? And so then I'm just staring at him all alone in a room, and I, he's, after he's told me everything in the world is shit. <laughs> well, that was Rodney, man. The heaviness, that's what I always say. Oh, the heaviness, Norm, the heaviness, you know. Oh, he would have been really old at that time. Yeah, he, uh, I guess the thing with Rodney is he didn't make it until he was like 50 or something, so uh, he didn't care for that, you know, he didn't like all the other people getting the, the, the fruits of show business, which to him were just drugs and women, you know, he came from that era where it was like, bah, broads, I tell you, booze, you know, so uh, he didn't like that he had to to wait till he was older to get that. <laughs> um, so, so okay. So you you start working on Weekend Update. You and Downey. Um, tell me about what did like, what did you learn about writing from that experience? Like you and just you guys were. It was was it pretty much just the two of you at a certain point? Yeah, me and Dan. Well, we decided like uh, very early on. Like I was like, let's just. Because I was like, I don't like jokes that are, I don't like jokes that are clever. I was telling him, I said, I don't like, like, uh, innuendos, like, are my least favorite types of jokes. I'd rather just say the thing, you know, and I was saying, like, you know, they always make innuendos so it'll be palatable so old ladies can, like, snicker at it. And I go, why not just say the thing outright, you know? And he was like, oh, that's interesting. And then he knew this band, The Clash, that he really liked. He was like, like you mean, he's like, you mean like The Clash? I'm like, I don't know what that means. But he like, just jokes, like stripped down jokes. So then he played The Clash for me. Go, oh, I understand. But yes, it's like that. Like, uh, like I listened to Outlaw Country. So I understood it was the same kind of idea. It was just strip it down to its essence, use as little few words as possible, and then just be preposterously blunt about things, rather than uh, rather than clever in any way. Our top story tonight: the nation is still reeling from Thursday's bombshell announcement that Lisa Marie Presley has filed for divorce from Michael Jackson. According to friends, the two were never a good match. She's more of a uh, stay-at-home type, and he's more of a homosexual pedophile. <laughs> So we decided to do that, and uh, uh, because we really wanted to do something different, uh, because there were so many monologues, and uh, then I also wanted to do a lot of uh, a lot of non sequiturs and stuff also. So uh, we qu very quickly had the idea of anti pandering, you know, where the audience was sort of our enemy, you know, the studio audience. Uh, or at least not complicit in the whole thing. Like they sometimes would be for the rest of the show. So I think, you know, updates suddenly became sort of like, didn't seem like the rest of the show, you know. It seemed like a thing within the show that uh, wasn't like the rest of the show that you were watching, you know. So people either liked that or they disliked it. I, I don't know. And uh, but that was the original. Uh, that was the origin of the, of the kind of um, idea behind update. I, you know, since then I've seen jokes that we sort of made up because I was always like, let's th think of new ways to say jokes that haven't been done before. Since then I've seen them, seen that done, like in mainstream and uh and nobody really seems to care anymore but at the time like it was confrontational to the audience it was i was a kid right so i would have been like 10 11 oh time. goodness gracious was, but it was thrilling right like for me it was like very thrilling oh that's right? cool very visceral of us you know? oh that's cool that's what we were going for we were trying to like go over the studio audience's head and to the people at home kind of because I was always saying to Downey, I like watching stuff like, especially Letterman, like, where it seems like I, me and him got it and nobody else did. You know what I mean? Like, 
kind of thing. Like I was like, ah, I, I don't care if nobody's laughing, Dave. I like it, you know, kind of idea. And and why do you think that you guys were allowed? Like, why do you think that you two were allowed to sort of have that kind of freedom and be so distinct from the rest of the show? We sort of had the freedom because uh, I was uh, willing to walk away, you know. Because Jim told me, Jim Danny told me early on, he was like, "You got." As soon as I got update, he goes, "You got to be careful with update because he goes, I've known very funny people uh, whom update has uh, shown to be unfunny. You know, uh, uh, they they seem unfunny yeah. even though they aren't. You know," he said. So you got to be careful about that. So I was like, "Okay, well, I want to." Since I'm alone here talking to the camera, you know, doing jokes, I sort of uh, don't want to take anybody's direction because it's my life, you know. It's my livelihood. It's me with my own name saying things. So I don't want anybody else's uh, input on what I should say as a joke. It's completely different than a sketch or a... Or anything like that, you know. I mean, and Lauren trusted you. Anyways, he trusted you to do it. Yeah, Lauren was good to us. He was. I don't know if he was ever, you know, a really big fan of the of update the way it was under Jim, not me. But he uh, he knew that. Uh, like you were saying earlier, like even if he doesn't like something, he'll go with it. He knew that update was uh, was gathering uh, momentum at that time. It was uh, certainly at least like a niche. Uh, um, and at some time, at some times in the show, it was the strongest thing in the show. You know. So he couldn't ignore it, you know. But he did not like not being in control of it. I know that. And, what, he told you that? and the rest? No, he never told me. But the re the re and the rest of the way it used to work on update is everybody would throw in jokes on Saturday. They'd kind of write it on Saturday, and they'd all sit around a big table and write update, you know, uh, while they ate. And I go, and when I went there, I was like, "Well, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to start writing." update on Monday, you know, and just write all day, every day. So, uh, so we, you know, cordoned ourselves off into one room and just did that and said, you know, see you Saturday to the rest of the cast and crew. So, I mean, the crew didn't take care, but I mean, to the rest of the cast, which, you know, I can see looking back, maybe. Maybe they didn't like that so much. Yeah. yeah. But, but you felt like, was there, was there a moment on Weekend Update that you felt was sort of like, that you look back on as like, I'm really glad we did that. That's the thing that I'm, you're sort of really proud of. Uh, I liked, uh, you know, we did, we would do a thing where the punchline would be like, Michael Jackson is a homosexual pedophile, something like that. I liked that. I remember Lauren going like, "You don't want Michael Jackson to sue you," and I said, "Oh yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be the fucking coolest thing if Michael Jackson sued me." But uh, I, I like that, you know. I like just saying things like outright that would sort of get gasps sometimes, out audible gasps I could hear from the audience. And when I heard that, I was like, "Oh, that's cool." And um. And then I guess like when, when did you sort of realize that it like it was a or like it, it became a problem like and and you know before you get fired did you sort of were you aware and did you and but you still continued to do your own thing like what is it did, was it just that you decided I don't care I'm not going to change my style or whatever like what yeah well um they told me in many different ways like I got word like. That I got word like fire Downey, you know, and you can keep your job and stuff like that, which I would never do. And uh, um, you know, yeah, take it easy. Just you know, everything doesn't have to be a shock, you know. And I was like, I was like, nothing, almost nothing's a shock. Maybe we do one shock joke. Most of the 
you know, and I think maybe the problem was with update was a lot of uh, jokes would hit silence, you know, and I think maybe, you know, the West Coast people were like, hey, well, Leno, you know, has wall to wall laughs for 15 minutes every night, you know, and we can't muster, uh, uh, you know, enough jokes to, to kill <clears throat> for once a week, you know? So I think that's what they were thinking, which I understand that. How did you get fired? Like, what was it actually like? To, what was the process of getting fired? What was that about? What <laughs> it was very odd. It was like... Uh, you know, no one would tell me. You know, I go, am I fired or what? Well, we don't know. You know, it doesn't look great or something. And so I didn't want to just wait. You know, till Saturday to see if I was hosting. So uh, did you still write weekend update before, like during that week? Yeah, yeah I, I thought we were still the host, and then um, I was told to phone Don Olmeyer, who was the president of the network which was really odd because we were talking about like a fight he didn't even want to fire me from the show it was he just update which was a five minute segment at midnight on a saturday so it's weird to get, that i'm talking to the president of nbc um but um uh, but yeah i phoned him and i said because this is what they told me they said they liked me but all my wanted me fired so I said yeah uh, I just want to make it clear I just want to understand so everybody here liked me but but you don't you didn't and he's like is that what they're saying and he goes I'll be the bad guy I don't care so he was intimating that other people wanted me gone too you know but well, she's probably he had no reason to lie how did it how did it feel was it how, how did it feel? I mean, did you was it was it strange for you not to work on the show? Like, what what was that first week like when you were not on the show? Um, well, I couldn't do update, but I was still on the show, so I felt I said I'm gonna write, I, I'm gonna do something that destroys on the show. So I I came up with a Quentin Tarantino uh, impression. So we we did a thing with Quentin Tarantino. And Burt Reynolds, which I do both of them. We did that in the pre tape and then that killed. And I ignored update, you know. And, uh, uh, well, no, the first week, actually, and then, I'm, I'm sorry, but then I wanted out. I was like, okay, that's enough. You can fire me now because it's too humiliating. You know, it's a big story in the paper that I'm not on update. Now I have to be in sketches and, you know, it's all self-conscious for everyone and uh um sure enough like i had to do one because because uh he would he just wouldn't let me go don omar just would not let me leave the show with any dignity you know so i said uh so i i just after that appear in sketches like smoking and wearing my street clothes and never going to make up and stuff like that. And then what was the first, so what was the, so you basically said and then, so what was that first week when you didn't work on the show, what was that like? I don't remember it, but I remember being depressed, like uh, that I couldn't go in because like you say, you know, the Monday you, you know, we would phone the house, and then Tuesday, you know, you have a whole fun routine, you know. Mm -hmm. um, which I could have reverted back to and just ignored update, but I don't know, I felt like it was a, the perfect exit strategy, really. What did you, did you learn, what did you learn from about comedy from Lauren? Did you learn, did you feel you learned anything about comedy or was it about learning what not to do or what was it that, what do you think you learned? Well, I learned, I learned, I did learn a lot from Lauren. I learned, uh, uh, the biggest thing I learned from Lauren was that there's no, um, there's no money in, or there's no success in being 
what he called Michael O'Donoghue, like in being a uh, comics comic. That that that's pointless because comics don't pay to see you, and that there's there's no shame in uh, in being um, in being a, a performer that's doing material that he feels you know you shouldn't feel any material is beneath you. That's what I learned, but that's what I rejected. So I I mean I don't know. I, I guess I didn't learn that. But but Lauren, you know, he, he taught me like that that uh, you should never uh, go after a private citizen and attack him com with your comedy. You know, he taught me that uh, uh, that uh, there's no um, gain in in saying anything bad about a person, even if you don't like them. So he taught me uh, things. He was kind of. You know, people project him as a very cold person, but he's actually a very uh, sweet human being that has uh, more life lessons than comedy lessons, I'd say. The smartest cat I ever knew at SNL, and a much revered figure there is joining us for another segment. This is my former producer, longtime writer and contributor, Jim Downey. Jim, uh, I had Norm on the show yesterday. I always thought Norm, from the first second I saw him, was just a flat out misanthropic genius. I always gave him a wide berth as far as time schedules and that because I just said, well, I'm going to grab Amadeus and tell him he has to be here to do busy work. You know what I mean? It, 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 that isn't going to happen. So uh, I think he's a genius. What was it like to work with him on Update? Well, he was, I mean, he is a genius and the most fearless performer. I mean, he, I mean, he likes people to laugh at his stuff he he you know it's it's he enjoys that but it's 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 sort of one of of like you know half a dozen important aspects of what he does mm -hmm. so that if he if he really loves a joke or a bit he will happily go out there and do it whatever the response is mm -hmm. and it, it, there is a if you want or want to hear a story um i there love was, me uh, a norm one time, story I one time it. we were in the office uh doing update stuff and and uh uh, there was a, there'd been a news item about, uh, there was going to be a newspaper for the homeless, you know, and so we were thinking about doing some of that. So we started improvising. It was more of a scene, not something we could do on, on mm -hmm. segment, but it was like, uh, like a tough kind of Perry White kind of editor going like, you, Miller, I want 500 words on going to the bathroom in your pants. You, uh, you know, uh, Emil, give me something, uh, give me a human interest thing on here in State Night. You, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And like a lot of, a lot of like photos, maybe some, you know, a little human stuff. Uh, you know, uh, what are, you know, pets, that kind of thing. And so nothing came of it, and, and I sort of forgot we had the conversation. And then the first meeting we have after the summer, uh, Norm goes to me and goes, Hey, hey, Downey, remember that, uh, you know, that thing we were talking about there with the, uh, remember that, that thing with the newspaper for the homeless, you know, that thing, the homeless newspaper? And I go, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, well, you know, I was out in L.A. and I, I was asked to do this benefit, you know, for the coalition to uh, feed the homeless. Or something, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, and I'm going, no, no, you, no. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I, I did that bit, you know. They hated it. <laughs> they hated it. All right, you tell me now. He that's part of the that's the Andy Kaufman part of the joke, or did, is yeah. he actually surprised that they hated it? That's what I can't quite figure with look. <laughs> I know. Jimmy calls in here periodically and says that he has bought a puppet and he wants to work material out on the show. And I'll say, well, tell me about the puppet. And it's an old man puppet who's a Holocaust denier. And it's obviously just Norm sitting at home talking as Norm. He makes no pretension to a puppet voice. I know. And I think he... He's he's Andy. I don't know. I view, I, I view a lot of Andy Kaufman in there. It's just a, well, he 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 also would like to. One of the things that he he would it really enjoy just getting into a character, and then you could not get him out of it. Like he he liked d doing old man stuff. Yes, like being an old geezer and complaining right. about aches and pains and stuff like that. And then you go, okay, Norm. That, now seriously, now we actually have to talk about. It. <laughs> oh my! You know, we'd one. start doing stuff about rheumatism and, and you know things like that. And you just had to plead with him to just to, to just stop. The, but uh, he 
he was on his own kind of yeah. you know set of rhythms. The speed which with with which he would take his uh, sport coat off at the end of his Letterman impression always used to. I would watch the thing just to to watch because Letterman's so ill at ease with show business. Always makes this conscious show of g- getting rid of the sport coat at the end of the show. And when Lauren picked up or when uh, Norm picked up on that and did that as impression. God, I fell out. Hey, I have to ask you about it. the real Andy Kaufman real quickly. What uh, uh, were you hip to him before he comes in, or what, what's well, that? Well, like? I I had not, you know, he had been on a, a couple of times the first season, and and I had uh, missed most of the first season, so I, I didn't really get to meet him until uh, year two. But he, um, <laughs> there was one time I was flying back from from visiting my family in the Midwest, and I and I and I arrive at Newark. Uh, airport, okay, at like midnight because the flight was delayed, and I don't know why, but I, in those days, I, I guess it was too cheap or something. But I, I decided to take the bus mm-hmm. into the Port Authority, and I get on the bus, and there's a solitary figure in the back in a brown hoodie, <laughs> and it was Andy Kaufman. <laughs> so we we went back to uh, to uh, 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 that was where we sort of bonded on yeah. that bus trip from New York Airport. So the next, this he used to come by the office and ask if anyone wanted to go see kung fu movies in Times Square. <laughs> that was when Times Square had virtually nothing but kung fu movies. Right. And and so I, I went a couple times with Mr. Kaufman, and he was he was like a just a fascinating person to be yeah. around. He quite. Um, you know he 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 loved those movies and could discuss them like a, a completely normal person but um when he when he wanted it to uh uh to to get into his his thing he was he was as as unshakable as norm you know yeah uh folks uh, i know that s n l over the last thirty five years has become the cultural place where young people hang their hat and if it does you any good in a world where people seem to get misappropriated power or misappropriated wealth to know that the finest man i ever met there was right at the center of it for over three decades should uh, do all our hearts well jimbo i love you love you right back all right we'll talk at you down the road that is the great jim downing here's a norm mcdonald story um we were filming uh, a sketch now before when we first got Sunday Live. Norm McDonald sat us all down, the cast, and he goes, listen, listen, I'm the update guy, okay? Now, if I want to do a sketch, I'm, I'm like the star, and I, I don't want it, but I'm getting it on. Don't write any of your sketches and put me in it. Don't put me in any of your gay sketches. That's what he said. He goes, but be prepared. If I'm doing a sketch, it's getting on. All right. Two years later, he doesn't do any sketches. He just does the update. Pamela, Pamela Anderson comes up. Now, whenever a beautiful woman would come on, Chris Kattan would always write a sketch where he gets to make out with the girl. <laughs> and he'd always over flirt with her like, oh my God, you're so sexy. You're hot. I want to set you up. Think you're cute. I want to go on a date. You single? I'm hot. I'm sexy. Which... Which was weird, because I always swore that he lived in the closet. Not that I care. No, no, no. I'm just saying, I always, you know, you're like, well, are you sure? Are you... you can tell me if you want. I just, you're pretty, because he was very, you know, he's very flamboyant, and he would always bring up gay in conversation, which was, to me, weird. You know, it's like... He's like, oh my God, I was watching football. I don't know, it just started making me feel gay. You ever feel that way? No. <laughs> Not really. But if it makes you, you know, all right. And that's, and I took that as a hint, you know, because like a, a pot smoker will hang out with a group and they'll go, and there's always one that drops the little hint to test the crowd. <laughs> You're know, like, yeah, so if we go out tonight, it'd be weird. You know, I don't really smoke pot, but, you know, maybe tonight if someone's got uh, nothing. But I would never do that, you know, because it's weird, and it's drugs and stuff. But you automatically know, like, oh, okay, he's, he's looking for, I'll talk to you when no one's around. So, so I didn't know if Catan was that guy. I'm like, oh my God, because he'd say it a lot. He'd be like, oh my God, I was on an airplane. And I don't know, I just felt gay. Not me, but you know, whatever, knock it out. 
So, Pamela Anderson, she's on the show. And she goes on, and we're getting ready to do a sketch. Now, when we read a sketch, we try it out on Wednesday. Wednesday, you want to read it, sell it, and try to get it to be picked up to work on for the week. Now, Norm MacDonald is playing uh, the guy from the Twilight Zone. Don't know, I don't remember his name, but the sketch is like, imagine if you will, another place in time. Welcome to the Twilight Zone. So, but Norm, this is how he reads the sketch. He goes, hey, uh, <laughs> imagine if you will, you know, another place in time, man. It's Twilight Zone, okay? Pig faces and... Well, they picked the sketch up and they put me, Catan, and Sherry O'Terry in the sketch, okay? Now, it's Saturday. It's Saturday. The day of the show. We go on the floor and if Catan wasn't starring in a sketch, he'd start nitpicking at other cast members. And he started busting on noise, like, oh my God, Norm, Jesus. You don't even sound like the guy. You're not gonna get, this, it's not gonna get picked up. Why are you acting that way? I mean, sound like the guy. Pamela, you're so hot, you're so sexy. Tommy Lee, I'm bigger than Tommy Lee. Me and you can hang out with that face. I'm like, God, Norm. Norm, you're awful, sound like him. And the whole time I'm looking at Norm, like, you're, you're not gonna do anything? I've seen you be so rude, you're like, you're not gonna, you know, you say something to Katan, you're gonna let him pick on you? And he's, and he's just looking at us, like, yeah, 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 thanks, man. <laughs> Nothing happens. Now, now's the dress show. On Saturday Night Live, there's a live show, and there's a dress show. The dress show, they film the whole show. God forbid something happens, they have a show in the can. But also, they do a lot of sketches because you're trying to get on. Sketches are gonna get cut and then you only see the live version. So we're working our ass off at the dress show, packed crowd, ready to go. One minute, one minute for the Twilight Zone. Norm MacDonald, Chris Kattan, Jim Brewer, Sherry up, Terry to the floor. We get on the floor as a crowd, our mics are on. Swear to God, Kattan's going, God, Norm, why'd you hear this guy? He sounds terrible. I can do impression better. Did you work on it? Pamela, you're so hot. I'm gonna suck face and rub up against you and me and you are gonna hang out and suck your face. You go in the party, we're gonna hump and hang out and dry hump your leg at the party. 30 seconds. God, Norm, you're never gonna get this. God, try. Aren't you guys concerned? We're not gonna get on the air. 10 seconds. I'm gonna bam, I'm gonna feel you and I'm gonna rub up against your butt and hot and... Go! Norm McDowell, hey, uh... Imagine if you will, another place in time, you know, and that's the same thing. I went, I can't believe this is where you want to try to knock it out. And he just let it go like that. Now, when the show's over, you walk into Lorne Michaels' room. And when you go in there, there's a billboard that shows you what sketches are on. And when we walk in, go ahead, I'll wait for you. When we walk in, <laughs> Take your time, take your time, it's over there. And, um... <laughs> when, we first walk, when we first walk in, it says the Twilight Zone sketch. I'm like, wow, how did that make it? I, so here we are, live show, monologue, Pamela Anderson comes out, first show of the, first sketch of the night. One minute, one minute for kickoff of the show. Jim Brewer, Sherry O'Terry, Chris Kattan, Will Farrell. No, no, Will Farrell. Norm MacDonald. All this show. So we get there. Live show. One minute to live on the air. Kattan starts. God, Norm. You're like terrible. We got one minute. You're going to sound terrible on national television. Don't you care? Oh my God. You don't even care. Don't you feel gay? God, what's wrong with you? And I can't believe, like, I'm getting mad that he's trying to throw Norm off his game. Like, he's a live, te live TV. And then, oh my God, Pamela, you go on the party, you're hot, and I'm you up. 30 seconds. God, Norm, wait till you hear him. It's terrible. Why don't you stay at the update desk? 20 seconds. Pamela, you're so hot. When I 15 seconds. Norm had a cigarette, puts it out. 10 seconds. 
Hey, uh, Catan. By the way, if everyone didn't know, Catan's gay, but he doesn't tell anyone he's gay. <laughs> and that's why he's this angry little bitch, and he just takes it out on everyone, and, and he tries to hit on Pamela Anderson, who you know would never be with you. She went timing late. Five seconds! <laughs> so why don't you just come out of the closet and make you gay, and you wouldn't live a lie, you little bitch? We're on! Imagine if you will. <laughs> Another. But so if you ever look for that sketch later on YouTube or something, look Pamela Anderson and look for the Twilight Zone sketch. And when you watch it, just watch me now that you know that story. Because all you're gonna see is the back of me and my shoulders doing this the whole sketch. <laughs> and then Katan next to me going, That is my name. You know, when the people, when the people here ask me to do the show, you know, I gotta say, I felt kind of weird, you know. I, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, I used to actually be on this show, you know. Uh, I used to do the uh, weekend update news routine, you remember that? And, uh, yeah. That's where I did the make-believe news jokes, you know. That was me, right? So then, a year and a half ago, right, I had a sort of a, a disagreement with the management at, uh, at the NBC. Uh, I wanted to keep my job, right? And they felt the exact opposite. So, so you see, they like, uh, they fired me because they said that I wasn't funny, you know? Now, now, with most jobs, I could have had a hell of a lawsuit on my hands for that, but, but see, this is a comedy show. So they got me, you know, you know what? You know what? But now, this is the weird part, right? It's only a year and a half later, and now they asked me to host the show. So I wondered, I go, hey, wait a second here. Hey! I go, how did I go in a year and a half from being not funny enough to be even allowed in the building <laughs> to being so funny that I'm now hosting the show. How did I suddenly get so damn funny? <laughs> It was inexplicable to me, because a year and a half, let's face it, is not enough time for a dude to learn how to be funny. <laughs> then it occurred to me, I haven't gotten funnier. The show has gotten really bad. <laughs> so yeah, I'm funny compared to, you know, well, you'll see later. But, <laughs> Okay, so let's recap. The bad news is, I'm still not funny. The good news is, the show blows. All right, folks, we got a bad show for you tonight. Dr. Dre, Snoop Doggy Dog, and Eminem are here. We'll be right back. He's the smartest guy I've ever met. But I mostly hang out with nightclub comics, so I don't know if that's in anything. But anyways, Jim, how you doing, pal? Norm, it's so good to hear your voice. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, because you're supposed to, right? <laughs> like this. So what do you no, want? I, 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 I'm a big fan of Norm MacDonald, uh, America. 
Jim and I worked together on a weekend update and got Best fired together. Best update ever in the history of television. Absolutely. And we got fired together. That's right. <laughs> Uh, which just only confirmed it in the minds of people like me. <laughs> but Norm, yes. you know, you said a few minutes ago when I was listening, you brought up Iran Contra, and I actually just wanted to underscore uh, the point you made that you weren't confident uh, enough in, which was that, um, you know, when people talk about Iran Contra, they they always talk about the rape of the Constitution and the shredding of you know the Bill of Rights, and and our founding fathers are rolling over in their graves, and. The, the issue at stake in Iran-Contra was this thing called the Boland Amendment, which was passed, I think, like in the 80s or late 70s. And it, the administration at the time said this is, it was basically a Congress saying that the president uh, couldn't do certain things in, in terms of his war powers and without their approval. And the uh, Reagan administration at the time said, uh, this is ridiculous, this is an unconstitutional bill, you cannot... The Constitution clearly, you know, gives the president these powers, and it was disputed, but never challenged in court. So this was this was a like a three or four year old, five year old uh, amendment that had that would never been uh, accepted by the other branch of government, and it wasn't. We weren't talking about tearing up the Constitution. In any case, what he, they did was they they uh, uh, got money by selling arms to like the ninth worst regime on earth to use against the seventh worst regime on earth, made a profit, gave it to the Contras, got the hostages released, and the Contras later won the election uh, it, that Jimmy Carter supervised, so uh, they must have at least been a little more popular than the Sandinistas. So I agree. I think if, if, if most things that uh, the Bush administration had done worked anywhere near that well, he'd be a very popular man right now. Wow, so Jim anyway, agrees so with you. You were right. <laughs> but uh, not for the right reasons. Hey, uh, Jim, I, I couldn't get that answer from that la- from Ken, but uh, why is Ahmadinejad more powerful than Abel Hassam Bani Sadr? <laughs> well, um, now I, I haven't kept it all straight, but you know that Bani Sadr was, was uh, executed by the regime like just a year or two after the hostages came out, or maybe even before they were released. And it was his there wife, too? There was a period too? there where, remember, there was Sadak Gotsbade, who was the more westernized spokesman, but no. they were going through prime ministers and, and uh, you know, ministers of state and so on uh, pretty quickly there. They're, uh, that was a crazy regime. Still is. But now, is this new, is this Khamenei guy also the spiritual leader? Well, you know, I, I, I have to say, I, I, thought, I thought myself that there, there was a new Ayatollah since then, uh, but a grand Ayatollah, but I, I, I can't, I have to plead ignorance. Ah, oh, shoot. I'm missing a lot of things. Where does that leave us, then? Uh, <laughs> SOL, my friend. <laughs> you know, but, Jim's um, an actor as well. Yes, I know. I've seen him in... Uh... Oh, and uh, There Will there Be Blood. There Will Be there Blood. Will be blood yeah. That was fantastic. Jim, I keep telling everybody that, that Daniel Day-Lewis is just doing an impression of uh, John Huston. Well, I think, I think he might have, uh, you know, been inspired by by that but uh um he was great though oh he's fantastic I, yeah. I mean he won the oscar I know. so that proves it right <laughs> did nothing wrong did he stay great in character man. uh in between the was he always in character um was he one of those experience yeah um we would we would ride back and forth you know uh to the to the scene because the the set where where we shot it was was on a ranch but uh, a gigantic ranch of many thousand acres, and it was so. Uh, they've had like a thirty-year drought there, and it was so uh, dusty that we couldn't drive more than like ten miles an hour or something. It was like creeping along. Otherwise, right. anything else would kick up huge amounts of dust. And so we were, we'd be in the car for these long rides, and he he pretty much stayed in character for you know talking conversations about like weekends and stuff. Uh, he's an interesting guy. I liked him a lot. Huh. Uh, so how would he talk? And <laughs> how would he talk? Well, he, he, I'd say like, um, so uh, we had a three-day break, I guess. So are you going to try to do anything interesting? Well, I, I was going to go to Carlsbad Caverns, <laughs> but uh, I think I might stay closer to home. <laughs> to be honest, it's the best burger I ever had. <laughs> you know, it's just funny to hear that voice uh, come out of that, that uh, face. That's great. 
But um, <laughs> so Norm on Iran Contra, don't yeah. uh, don't apologize. <laughs> hey Jim. Yeah. You know, I was mentioning how great you were and everything. Yeah, thanks so much. And and how you saved the show every four years. Yeah, I bet they like hearing that. But um, <laughs> but yeah. that's what you feel too, right? Yes. <laughs> I think I'm. I you know I certainly make my contribution. And because I saw a book, I, I was I was in a bookstore. I know you're familiar with bookstores. Oh yeah. You're not one of these fellows that go on Amazon. I bet you probably aren't computer savvy like me. Like I am not. I'm not really computer savvy because I, I I really believe they're Satan's uh, uh, instrument. And uh, you you ser- you're serious, right? Um, absolutely. You know me and Satan. No, I I um I just haven't really gotten around to it. Oh, you so know. you don't see that 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 they're. Probably. I don't. I don't really. Uh, go online and and use computers and stuff but anyways i was gonna say i was in a bookstore and i saw there's a book actually called strategery yeah i saw that yeah and that you made that up i did make that up i should have copyrighted it like three peat you know (laughs) then i'd uh i could have made i don't know a couple hundred bucks maybe didn't they actually start using that term i think that they started using that term as part of their they 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 sort of they liked it and, and adopted it, and they would they would call their meetings strategic sessions. And I know Rush Limbaugh used it a lot. You know a um, term they use, Steve. I mean, uh, Jim, a lot. Hmm. Remember when I would start the the weekend update? I go, "This is the fake news because it was such a retarded right. thing to say." Now they say instead of mock news, they actually say fake news. Like they'll say, "Like uh, Stephen Colbert does a fake news program," or you know what I mean. Well, yeah, and then you and me are in the same boat. We got to get a lawyer. <laughs> but in right? this case, in the fake news case, it's it's just idiotic that they've that they use it because it was meant to be a, a sort of silly. Well, um, you know, so I, obviously, I didn't think that I, I was sort of surprised that the Bush people liked strategy too. They, they, um, but you know, people have. What do you mean, the Bush people? Well, that that it it wasn't. I mean, it was sort of making fun of him, of course, uh, when I put that word in his mouth in that sketch. But but they like loved it. They thought it was the greatest thing ever. So um, that's why they they themselves started calling their their uh, morning meeting strategic sessions. I guess. Huh. Now, do you think that's because George Bush is just contemptuous of? I I don't think so. I think they just they just have embraced sort of self-deprecation, you know? I, I, I think that uh, that's always been his response to being made fun of, right? Who are you to, supporting, to Barack? Own it. Um, I, well, you know what? I actually, this year, I, I kind of like both uh, candidates uh, for very different reasons. I mean, you know, Barack Obama, it's hard to argue, is, is like the first really cool guy who's run for president in our, like, sentient lifetimes. I mean, you know, you weren't probably alive, and, and I was a, a tiny kid when uh, JFK... Well, but, but I, I, I was but I was, a, uh, I was a young man when... Pierre Trudeau, right? Yeah, who was very cool. Yeah, and it, it is, it is uh, it's, it's an actual value. I mean, it, uh, it would certainly be more fun to travel in Europe, I would think, uh, when Obama is president, but you know, on the other hand, McCain has a, uh, there's a lot to admire about him, although we're not seeing as much of it as we, we saw eight years ago when he ran um, for the nomination. You know? You know, but I, I did see him, like, on C-SPAN the other night doing one of these town hall meetings, and the guy's exceptional at one-on-one speaking with someone. Well, yeah, I mean, his, 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 that's where you can most impress people by straight talk, you know, because you're... It's face to face with with uh, someone. It's it's uh, now. If Obama was doing that face to face, would he come off as dogmatic or? No, I think I think he I think Obama is great at every single form of communication. He's great at the big speech, you know, the the rock rock and roll kind of thing in the arena, and he's he's great in um, you know the smaller town hall things. It, they said it in, in debates. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't as good, but I, I think that, that he just wasn't as aggressive in debates, which is another thing, and, and I'm not sure that people uh, necessarily want people to be that, that uh, uh, aggressive. You, you don't want to come down, you don't, you don't want him, 
you're afraid he's going to look like Jim Brown or something if he. <laughs> well, no. Is that no, what you're I saying? Just, I just I don't mean that at all. I just mean that that you know in in the debates like with with Hillary where where she was going after him more, um, and people said, well, he seemed on the defensive. But that's just because he was he was sort of trying to deflect and not land any punches, and and I, I think he was sort of. Um, Aware that uh, uh, if he just stayed cool, he he had a lead and he was going to end up winning. You know, I mean, he had, it was a brilliant strategy. He ran for the nomination. I mean, if you think about it, uh, he he was such a long shot, and he just he just figured that uh, um, he will he will clean up in all these little places uh, where uh, the Hillary Clinton won't bother to invest any resources, and then. You know, so I, I read somewhere the other day that he, um, like Idaho, <laughs> should probably have no Democratic delegates since they're not going to be able to deliver anything for the Democrats. But um, they had like 14 delegates or something, and Obama won, I think, 13 of them. You know, wow. hmm. and and he then he would lose a state like New Jersey to Hillary, but lose by like 12 delegates. So, you know, it was a brilliant. I mean, Hillary probably could have could have blown him away had she just you know, uh, taking the thing much more seriously in the beginning and just made sure that she was going to crush the opposition in every single arena. Hey, Jim, can you stay for another section? If you'll have me. I call them sections. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right, we'll be back with our next section. Hi, Norm McDonald filling in for Dennis Miller and the Dennis Miller Show. The number to call is 866-509-RANT, 866-509-7268. If you have any questions for uh, <clears throat> Jim Downey, who is a fascinating guy and uh, was there since the, I don't know if it was quite since the beginning of Saturday Night Live, but it's close to, shared an office with Bill Murray, didn't you, Jim? Yes. Oh, yes. The second season, I came the second season, same time Bill did. Oh, yeah, yeah. But listen, man, Steve has a question for you. It's all right if, if America has no questions. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a head. <laughs> no, America, America's going to be... <laughs> our, our things might crash. Don't things crash? But Steve uh, has a question, a political question. Okay. Just you're so well informed, I'm just curious what your opinion is. With uh, Obama, he's such a great speaker, but how do we know he's more than a great speaker and maybe it doesn't matter I mean maybe being a great speaker is enough to just motivate the country what do you think about that um well you know the thing is uh in in a way as president being a great speaker is is more of a qualification than um than having a great uh you know issue agenda because an issue agenda can be supplied by really smart unattractive behind the scenes people right but to sell something like like I thought one of Bush's one of the crazy things truly crazy things that Bush did was when you do when you have like an unpopular agenda like a war in Iraq that that we started right you damn well better have a uh, like a kick ass uh, persona to sell it you know and to 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 pair like an unpopular initiative with an awkward and inarticulate uh, defender right. of that of that initiative is is like the worst of everything. Like in Clinton, you had almost the opposite, where he would he was playing it so safe he would he would push really like tiny uh, miniature little little uncontroversial things that poll tested at like sixty percent. But then he had you know a much he was much better at selling things than right. than uh, George W. Bush is, and and I'm not saying that 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 someone like Barack Obama could have totally sold uh, Americans on the Iraq war, but they would have, he would have done a much better job because, you know, uh, they, uh, uh, clearly, I mean, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, uh, I know before we went in, I'm pretty sure that it was, the public was slightly against. It was, it was like, you know, right. 49, 46 or something. Um, only when it only was really popular when it looked like it was easy, you know, the first couple months. Right. And then it's been, you know, but it was. I, I'll give Bush this at least that that he wasn't afraid to do something unpopular. 
But the problem is you really, you know, presidents need to be uh, eloquent and they, they need to be articulate because they have to, if they're going to do anything worthwhile, it's going to probably be unpopular with at least a, a, a decent chunk of the population. And, and you have to be, you have to be able to sell it. Hey, Jim, yeah. <laughs> are you on Steve Dunn with your gab fest? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're like a couple of chatterboxes. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. A couple of, that's just a hen house horse. Hey, we're going to go to break, but then we got all these questions for you, Jim. So you'll stick around, right? All right. Okay, cool. The Dennis Miller Show. Fifteen seconds, guidance internal, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, engines on, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all engines running, launch commit, lift we have lift off at 9.34. The Dennis Miller Show, 866-509-7268. This is the Dennis Miller Show. Dennis is on assignment. Norm McDonald reporting. Uh, we have with us Jim Downey, who uh, is uh, probably, other than Lauren, the uh, most important thing to the success of that show throughout the years. He's been there since near inception. And uh, so if you have any questions about Saturday Night Live, this would be the guy to ask. So uh, give us a call at 866 866- 509 rant that's 866-509-7268 for those of you that weren't listening 866-509-7268 hey jim it's yeah. stevie here when you started on saturday night live it was the second year of the show right right so they were still doing all the the cocaine and the drugs well, it got and good the... the second year you know <laughs> that's right that, that, that is where the the famous year uh, but what? How long did those drug years last? Like, when did that stop? Like all the the wild, crazy. I, it wasn't. It wasn't particularly uh, wild and crazy. I think to the really? extent that stuff like that happened, it was more uh, to stay awake than it was to you know have a good time. And and I I think it it that stuff was pretty much gone by like the third season. You know, uh, it, you know it's it's. It's just because of the you know spectacular Belushi story. Uh, right. it, it has a lot of uh, um, you know that's been etched into the consciousness, but uh, it really was not much of a feature of the I show. I see. That's interesting because even at the time he was extreme, so I guess that sort of colors what the whole world must have been like. Well, yeah. I mean, he was um, he was you know one of a kind, and and, and obviously his his most destructive he phase was, one... was after he left the show. You know. He was one of a kind. Yeah. What about Wasn't Jim he? Belushi? <laughs> there was a, there was Jim Belushi. Jim is is very close, and actually, Jim Belushi, let me say, is one of the best actors who's ever been on that show. Wow. I mean, if you ever saw Jim in like uh, Salvador or, or something, he's a really good actor. Um, uh-huh. Hey, Jim, do you mind and talking? John was too, huh? Do you mind talking to the uh, the hoi polloi, as you call them? <laughs> As I, I well, I'd like to dismiss them as a high point. Like, listen, Norm, I want to make clear to the audience that yeah. I haven't been at the show every single year. I tend to come and go, and certainly if well, no, you had to leave. Didn't like, I was not there. You had to leave to create uh, the David Letterman show. You bet. That's right. We have a question from Gary in Saginaw, Michigan. Okay. You want to hear it? I'd love to hear Gary's question. Hey, Gary, what's up? Norm, first of all, I want to tell you what a pleasure it is to talk to you. First of all. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very exciting for me. Thanks for filling in for Dennis, man. I love Saturday Night Live. I love your movies. Ah, you're sweet. Uh, uh, you're, you're a heck of a guy, man. I love your kind of humor. You know, there's, there's not very many norms around in this world, and we need more, but uh, I'm happy with you. So uh, how's it going? <laughs> it's going great, man, but I thought you were going to ask Jim a question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got one for him, too, but I want to talk the whole stuff. <laughs> That's nice, man. You're a good man. So, uh, Jim, uh, what, what do you got poking in the fire? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm hoping this goes really well, and, and I, could, I could do another uh, couple of uh, sections of Dennis's show. Maybe I'm not, not with Dennis right away. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that. But, you know, uh, 
Uh, certainly, Norm. I think Norm would have me back, right, Norm? Hey, listen, man, uh, I'd have you back well. anytime. But um, sick, but I don't think that's no, what he, I'm, I'm, I don't think really, that's what he I, meant. I'm gonna. I'm, I don't think um, that's what he meant when he said. Back at the show, I'm gonna be back at the show next fall. Uh, and they just issued the schedule, and, and uh, what sketches have you got working on? You, you don't. I, don't I mean, it's probably it's going to be um, uh, mostly political stuff for the fall because they, uh, God bless him, Lauren uh, is starting a month earlier than we usually start, and starting with four in a row, which is something you've never done. I'll bet, Norm. I've never done four but we're in a row. Going on September thirteenth. We're going to be on for the next four weeks with one week off and then three weeks. Wow. So it's going to be, uh, we're, we're going to be dead. If you're going to do four in a row, you're not going to have much time for poking around in the fire. <laughs> no, no, that's a terrible way to find ideas, too. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six. I was just looking at, we have like seven shows before the election plus three primetime Thursday specials. That's wow. ten wow. different elements of pre-election stuff. Hey, you want to take another question from what well, That's you, what I'm going to be doing. You want to take another question from what you refer to as the uh, great unwashed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it on radio that would be okay, right? Yeah. I, can't, I can't get hurt on radio. This is okay. Gary from New Mexico. Oh, great. I like the land of hey, enchantment. Hey, how's it going? The land of what, Gary? The land yeah. of enchantment, right? Land of enchantment. Yeah, it's beautiful over here. It's been raining every afternoon. It just couldn't, couldn't be better. Life's great over here, just like another day in paradise. It's great, and I just wanted to say, hey, Norm, uh, man, thanks for all the many, many laughs, your, your, your tops in my book. Anyway, my question is, uh, which comedian was the, is the best and, and, and is the most genuine and truly great to work with, uh, on, you know, as far as uh, being nice off the set during, you know, during takes and all that stuff? Who's the best comedian to, to work with? Who's the sweetest? Comedian? You mean a, w- a woman, right? Right, right, yeah, comedian. I'll bet Norm's going to say Roseanne, right? <laughs> no, seriously, wouldn't you, Norm? Yeah, I love Roseanne. Yeah. yeah, I like her too. I've always had a great time. I, our, but this is was directed at Norm, right? No, no, it was directed at you about the uh, well, comedian. In, in I guess he means like not people who've been in our cast. At the no, show, he members. But, he means people that have been in the cast. Oh well, I mean, I, let me say that I would say that that the last couple of years. Uh, now, now, Maya Rudolph has left the show, but I would say at the time when we had Maya Rudolph and, and uh, Amy Poehler and, and uh, uh, Kristen Wiig, I would say those three, easily the best group of women, there's no other group of women comes close as far Boy, as... Boy, Kristen Wiig, I saw her do something on Update. I don't know what it was, but she talked real fast. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Man, that was a real tour good. de force. Yeah, yeah but, but that I'd say that group of women... Um, as a group, it's it's the best the show's ever had, and and uh, uh, and, and the new uh, girl Casey Wilson is great too, and she's going to be right up there. She's just starting out, but um, she's the heavier lady. But well, <laughs> she's no, but but she's the new girl. But but the, no, the, I meant um, heavyweight. What do you think? What are you talking about? No, but but the <laughs> why does but everything over the, have to over go? The years of the show, there have <laughs> never been uh, uh, there's never been a group like that. There have been individual uh, women here and there, and 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 of the. We, you know, Norm, have we ever had many women hosts who are comedians as opposed to actors? I don't think we've had that many. No. I mean, Ro- Roseanne Barr is, uh, is well, the only we, one we I had really Roseanne. come to mind. Yeah, huh? we had, yeah, we had Roseanne. And, and Ellen DeGeneres, was, was, I, I think, is really funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, but are, you nice don't think women are as funny as men, right? Um, <laughs> I, I do. I think that men are much more interested as, as, a, as you know, generally speaking, in comedy and and uh it's you know the norm is more guys trying to make girls laugh than the reverse right so so i mean i think that's why men tend to predominate in comedy but um that, i mean you know th- there's always plenty of openings for who's a great woman fun. writer name five great women writers on saturday night live um i would say uh right now we have paula pell who's great uh we have, um, uh... Hey, you want to take what? a call from Joel? <laughs> Wait a minute. In Kansas City? Me... No, I don't uh, want to embarrass you. You're having trouble getting past one. <laughs> not. Here's Joel from Kansas City. <laughs> hey. I'm sorry. Did Jamma, I yes. hope you're no relation to uh, Robert Sr. or Jr. Uh, it's, it's a complicated. 
Okay, uh, I won't go there. I don't hey, I've been a great it. fan of the show since 72, and I've never, never gotten a straight answer other than Lorne's genius. But why is it that every time the group changes, I can't stand them? The show has gone to pot, it's awful, and two years later, they're the best ever. How could they do this for 35 years? Well, did I you work on I the show in 1972, Jim? <laughs> well, <laughs> I wasn't I on the air there. Now, give him a break. Now, I, I would say that if that hasn't always worked, but um, there was like we had a really bad group uh, that that I had nothing to do with the picking of. But in 1985, that 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 was kind of a disastrous season. But I would say in general, it's true because people people um, just sit on their hands and sort of resent the new people and, and need to be won over. Hey, and, Jim. Uh, it takes people a year or two to find their footing yeah, at Jim, the show. Yeah, Jim, that's, that's cool, man. Listen, Bryce has a great question, and it's a question that I've always wondered about. Bryce, are you there? Hey, I am, man. How you doing? Good, man. Hey. He's from the Mile hey. High City, Jim. Well, I'm oh, my telling God. You, it's, uh, so this is like a Western theme. It, it really sucks here, so all these Californians and Texans can go back home. Yeah. Uh, hey, I quit watching TV when they canceled your show, Norm. Uh, I want you to know. <laughs> quit watching TV? Yeah, I quit watching TV when they canceled your show. Oh, that's nice. So did that you. Uh, a lot of I, I got a question for Steve. Was Pat a man or a woman? Pat was... Yeah, was Pat a man or a woman? Pat was a man. Pat was a man. And uh, I think that should have been obvious to anyone who who really watched Farley the show told carefully. Me. Chris Farley told me it was a woman. Maybe it was a woman. It might have been a woman. <laughs> he said it was Pat could have been a woman. He said it was played by some broad. Pat was played by uh, a, a woman, Julia Sweeney, who created the character. Oh, well, she's a woman then. Okay. A woman, but no, but he means conceptually what was Pat uh, uh, meant to be in reality. And I think, I think Pat was a man. That's just a theory. That makes sense because it was played by a woman, so he was a, fe- a very feminine man. Yeah, it seems like otherwise, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, it, she could it could have been a woman too. So uh, I hope I've I've covered that. <laughs> Norm, you cut me off when I was naming my favorite women writers. I didn't get to say Emily Spivey, who's who's there right now, who's a genius. Uh, you're just naming people that are on this. Pam Norris, sh- huh? You're- no, Pam Norris was was a writer like 20 years ago. Okay, keep going. That's three. Okay, go. Rosie Schuster. Yeah. Uh, I'm just a. Uh, um, four. <laughs> Tina Fey is a great writer, but I think of her now as a performer. But she's a very good writer. Well, that's five. Uh, that's you did five. it, you Jim. Go. You did it. You did it. <laughs> oh, I could. I could go on and on. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Let's do ten then. <laughs> let's no. Let's let's. Because uh, then I'm just going to piss off people I don't name. If, All if right, Jim. We'll we'll take a break and let and we'll let you collect your thoughts. Okay. <laughs> Norm McDonald, sitting in for Dennis Miller on the Dennis Miller Show. I'm here with Stevie Ray Fromstein, and uh, we're still talking to Jim Downey, who's been kind enough to stay with us. Jim Downey, he's a, he's a pundit, <laughs> and he's a yeah. writer, but I want to talk about his acting career, because Jim's a great actor, and uh, on Saturday Night Live, he created, um, he did Change Bank, which was a very funny uh, sketch. And uh, he sometimes casts himself when he thinks it's the right choice to make. Once every ten, every ten or fifteen years, yeah. I, I cast myself. But then you have guys like Paul Thomas Anderson and uh, Bob Saget and directors like that. that, <laughs> that That's right. Uh, Tamara Tamara Davis. Tamara Davis. So. Yeah, so so I, I your, pick my shot. What, what was you know? your best performance, serious, honest to God, in film? What was it? I know the answer, but dirty work. Um, I well, the one that people seem to talk about at all <laughs> was uh, was uh, uh, Billy Madison. Yeah, because you, what was the speech you said? It was a variation of the thing that Norm, you probably heard me say to Chris Farley many times yeah. in writers' rooms, but just about how. You know, uh, that suggestion or idea was so uh, idiotic that 
everyone who heard it is now dumber. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> did you? Were you? Did you write the Chris Farley show? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I mean, it was basically sort of inspired so heavily by Chris Farley. It's not like I said, "Do you think you could do this?" You know, it was more. I have a. I want you to just do exactly what the kind of thing you're always doing. You know. But you knew Chris, you know Norm. You knew him. He he uh, he would he would do that kind of stuff. Um, uh, sit and just pump you for information about about stuff where clearly he knew it the subject better than you did. Who was the know? funniest guy ever on Saturday Night Live? Man, uh, you know it's it's I, I'd prefer to say that there's like a group of like ten people who it's hard to find because you know it, it's it's Is it Paula uh, Pell or. Uh, well, she's not a performer on the show, but but no, I, but I mean just in the room. No. Uh, oh, you it, mean the fun, well? You know, I thought I always thought that uh, uh, Norm, you were one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Certainly, no, no, I'm I can't think of. Um, well, like Bill like, Murray, like David Spade is hilarious. He's unbelievably right? funny, but I meant yeah, he's he's probably the funniest guy in in real life. But I'm saying but if you're, on if you're, on uh, as a sketch performer, as a sketch performer, I mean the list. Would, and I don't know how to pick from among it, but it would have to include uh, Aykroyd, um, Bill Murray, uh, Eddie Murphy, uh, Dana Carvey, uh, um, uh, well, geez, Will Ferrell. Uh, uh-huh. um, I think... I think uh, so you didn't of, like Belushi, then? <laughs> well, I'm just... I don't know that... I, don't, I wouldn't put John at the first tier. That's all I'm saying. I'd put uh-huh. him, like, second team. Because just like because I know because otherwise this this first team is going to have way way too many guys and they won't get playing time and they'll be unhappy. that's interesting you didn't mention a woman oh I thought you said the funniest guys I was going to say the women next I said the funniest performers okay well there at C I hate women you got it out of me <laughs> still um, I think that uh, uh, also it, it just well, I'd say that's the women we have now I mean I don't know how you'd have to how you'd pick between among I should say. Uh, Maya Rudolph and uh, Amy Poehler and Chris Wig. I mean, I think you'd choose Gilda Radner, wouldn't you? Um, well, I I I, I love Gilda Radner, and I think she was really funny. Uh, I I again, okay, she's on the first team. She made the first team. Sweet, um, Jim. But uh, um, and then I I better think of the ones I knew. Well, Jan Hooks was great. You oh, know. Yeah. Um, okay, we know you like girls. 